Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. Great to be with you on a Friday. It's Hale Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Will Wilson rocking the Timberwolves gear. God love him. We are loaded up. The uh, Well, the, the biggest fan of, of Derek Peterson from Hale Varsity, I, I do believe, is Garth Brooks. They're both Oklahoma guys. And uh, one has a cowboy hat and can sing. The other talks to, to Taylor Martinez on his podcast and does really good Monday columns for Hale Varsity. I'll, I'll, I'll let you figure that out. But excited to talk to the good doctor, our Chicago correspondent, uh, in about 20 minutes. The pride of Fairbury is Bill Dolman, uh, NBC Sports. Bill Dolman, let the world know. Let the world know. That he has not seen Field of Dreams. <laughs> mm. Wow. Uh, yikes. I love Bill Dolman. There's probably a Russian flag hanging <laughs> over his mantle. <laughs> I'm kidding. But doesn't that just seem, of all dudes that would love Field of Dreams, Bill Dolman's probably a top three draft pick. And he has not seen Field of Dreams. What a, what a scene last night. We'll get into some Nebraska football. Coach Frost met the media today, so we'll hear from Frosty. Coming up here, uh, this segment, uh, Bill Dolman. And then an extended sit-down with Jay Moore. We will try and talk him into wearing some cowboy boots. Numbers to get in, 466 466-3776-800-825. 5865. Find us on Twitter, Chris Schmidt at Schmidt underscore radio at Willie on the radio for Will Wilson. He's like, yes, you got it right. Yes, you got it. Okay. Uh, so follow Will on Twitter and email us, Chris at HaleVarsity.com. So last Friday, we we took inventory on the best ways to uh, to do your sweet corn. So today, a little fun Friday topic, cowboy boots. I had cowboy boots, I think, when I was younger. I mean, we're talking pre-K. Junior was all about cowboy boots, pre-K. And I know Barrett Rude collects cowboy boots, so he's a big cowboy boot guy. I never made the, the jump. My, my dear late father, bless his heart, got, got caught up in the, the Western attire. There was no urban sombrero in his repertoire but one time on a trip a family trip down to arizona we went to tombstone and and he bought this like leather overcoat that was western themed there was no wrestling mask or or other accessories that came with it but we were all a little a little weirded out and let's just say he didn't wear it out too often but he had this, it looked like something Doc Holliday would wear. Oh, yeah. Or, or Wyatt Earp would have rocked. <laughs> right? That's one too many Miller Lights down in Tombstone around the Fiesta Bowl time of 1996. That's, that's where I'm going to go with that. But cowboy boots, Will, you like country music. You're on kicks at night. Yeah, I, I used to have a really nice pair, but I grew out of them. Uh, so I- did, you, did you wear them... I mean, I, I pray because you see, like Miss Nebraska, when it's nice and sunny and warm out, you see all sorts of beautiful women. Love the boots. Just wear the cowboy boots. Love and the boots. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. Love the boots. Yeah, the boots are cool. Yes, but you're not wa- you're not rocking cowboy boots with with uh, with joggers with, on with, with jean shorts. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. Okay, no. but but you had cowboy boots. I did. Yeah, it was a special day though when I brought them out. Mainly in high school, Schmitty. I wore them a few times, and uh, like I said, it was a special day with jeans though had to be with jeans well yeah i mean you, mm-hmm. you got to wear them with jeans did you have uh dude i am not trying to stereotype did you just go with a normal belt or was there normal was there a black shirt it belt was casual buckle? very casual so you yeah. can you can wear them mm-hmm. right Definitely. you can wear them and 
I just haven't dove in. I hear they're like insanely comfortable. Uh, it depends. They got to fit right for me. That's for sure. And but, but once they're broken in. Once they're broken in, they're fine. But I'll tell you what, man, those first few months, they are tough to get on and off. Maybe I just don't know how to do it. And I don't know. But I, I had to ask. So we'll we'll talk to, to Dr. Petey here about some some cowboy boots, some, some Nebraska football, and I think the world will descend on Memorial Stadium. The thing that's odd and funny, and, and I get the climate here uh, with uh, Mr. Delta variant, but you see a lot of, a lot of seats for sale. Yeah. Like, people shell out 100 bones or whatever for them, and there's some posted on Facebook for 50 bucks. I've seen some for like 8 to 10 bucks if I want to truly get into the stadium <laughs> tomorrow night. I don't. And it's not that I don't don't like Garth. It just, my mom's out of town. I'd probably have taken her because she's a, a big Garth fan. Mm-hmm. But it is, he's one of those guys that, uh, he's phenomenal. Yeah. But I just never had a, a big collection of his music. I'll tell you what, you mentioned Oklahoma and how he's a, he's a Sooner he's guy an o- too. He's, well, he's an Oklahoma State guy. Oklahoma Garth State, is, gotcha. Yeah. Well, you know, when you mentioned Oklahoma, I, I like Toby Keith. I like Toby Keith better. And he's from obviously so. Yeah, I mean, he's, yeah, no. To, so you're you're more of a Toby guy. Yeah, he's a legend. Yeah, Toby's cool. Mm-hmm. I hope we bump into him down in Norman. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay, uh, you have the numbers to get in. Uh, Will, let's uh, dive into some Scott Frost right now. Also, ESPN came out with their top 100 coaches in the last 50 years. We'll dive in shortly as to where Coach Osborne ended up. Too high, too low, just right, Husker Nation. Uh, We'll hear that argument one way or the other in a moment. But with Scott Frost, so let's let's get this down. Let's get things out of the gate. The the world's wondering about the tight ends. Okay, what's the word on Austin Allen? What's the word on Travis Vokalek? What's happening if if either guys aren't good for Illinois? That was addressed, uh, not necessarily timeline by Scott Frost. But just uh, specifically that guys weren't at practice this week. Here's a little more from Coach. Yeah, it's strange. We've been nicked up at that position. Every camp, it seems like there's one position where you, you kind of get a rash of things. And, um, you know, Chris and Austin are going to be fine. Travis will be back. We had an appendectomy and uh, um, just kind of another little fluke thing. And we've been a, a little hurting at depth there. The good thing is, is we've been getting young guys reps at that position um, that I think are going to help us down the road. So, um We'll keep getting the, those guys healthy and feel good about where we'll be for game one. So, let's let's talk about what nick, nicked up means. Nicked up is what? Is, is Vokalek going to be ready for Illinois? Don't know. Is Austin Allen somewhere inside Memorial Stadium uh, with bubble wrap around him? Uh, and Chancellor Brewington, all name team. He's a kid who used to kick your ass and take your money in, in prep school with that type of name. But in all seriousness, he's done really well. More from Coach Frost here on who's backing up at tight end. Uh, of course, you, you've got Hickman, right? The the the, the Burks the, the the Burks standout, and you, you also have uh, Carney uh, making some way. Uh, the the really talented kid out of Norris. So you have young guys, but man, you want to lean on some of those older vets in an opener like Illinois. More from Coach Frost here on some of those names behind you, your two mainstays at tight end in Allen and in Vokalek. Yeah, we, we've actually moved two guys on uh, Chancellor Brewington that transferred in uh, to our program. He's a, a big receiver, and he's gone in and done a good job learning and getting reps at tight end. And then uh, Jacob Herbeck, uh, we moved to, to tight end, too, and brought into camp uh, just to give us some more legs. So no relation to Kent at first base for the Twins, but Jake Herbeck and Chancellor uh, Brewington. So Brewington, you know, he made an appearance on some of the, the videos, right? Who was that catching the football? Uh, and Brewington's kind of more of a, a lean, mean, muscular dude. And, and that's not to say the other two tight ends aren't muscular. They're, they're giant. They block the sun. Brewington, good size for sure. But he's more of of probably a, I don't know, a slot, big-bodied wideout, right? That's that's where I'm going to go with that. So, listen, uh, Nebraska's offense, to me, was going to going to lean heavily on the tight ends, 
That's what Coach Lubick was talking about. Uh, from a read standpoint with your quarterbacks, you wanted to, uh, under Coach Lubick, probably integrate more uh, tight end usage or their earlier in the read setup for your quarterback. Great, but you kind of want to have both of them available. And there's just tip of the iceberg with, with Vokalek because of how big and physical he is. And, and if he's out an extended period of time or if he's nicked up and that nicked up bleeds into week one or week two, and I don't have a timeline. I'm just talking out loud here, not stoking any fire. Uh, of Austin Allen's recoverable, I mean, clearly he's got the most experience for you. I think Vokalek's probably one of your top end-line blockers uh, in in the position group. I think he's a money point of attack guy. And I think Austin Allen's really worked hard to be a better blocker as well. So we'll see where things go. But Brewington, Herbeck, and of course you have Carney and, 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 and um, uh, Hickman uh, are, are the guys that you're thinking about with, uh, with Nebraska tied in. So Nebraska will have to adjust, assuming uh, they don't have one or both back, maybe just one. Uh, Turner Corcoran has missed uh, quite a bit of camp, too, with some soft tissue injury. Uh, a little birdie told me that. So uh, you've seen uh, more and more uh, on the offensive side of the ball with Brant Banks. And he's really a guy that's young in the program, but, man, uh, great uh, footwork, great size. And Banks is one of those guys that's impressed at guard or tackle. So he's been right there. Let's hear a little bit more from Coach Frost on the offensive line side of things. Uh, specifically with with where things are going. We'll do cut 16 here. Um, hmm, 16. I'm trying We're, to find that one, Schmitty. Cut 16 here. Um, I'll go back in your folder here. I, I, didn't, I don't not see 16. Is here. there one with Brant Banks or yes, offensive line? I Thank see you. that right here. Number 12 here for you, Schmitty. Here I you am go. bad yeah, at Yeah, Brant's been no, working with not. the ones, um, with the twos a little bit. Um, we got more depth on the line than we've had. Nuri's done a good job. Um, Bando's done a good job. Hickson's done a good job. Um, don't want to leave anybody out, but there's a lot of guys doing well. And I think that's going to give us the ability to keep guys fresh and get more guys into the game. So, listen, they're still figuring things out on the offensive line. You hope that, that Corcoran's a guy that can get back at it. And he's um, – when, when we talk soft tissue, I mean, those are things that can be a pulled hammy or something along those lines that if you rush back – You can tweak right away until you're 100%. Uh, The real interesting thing, though, is is Scott Frost and what he loves about Garth Brooks. All right, let's get into the favorite Garth songs from Scott Frost. I'd say Every Time That It Rains is probably my favorite overall, though. It's too many. Okay, so there you go. Uh, More on the Garth show from Scott Frost. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm excited. Uh, uh, I'm just excited to see the stadium full again. I've never been in my box before. My wife's been in there. I've never been in it, so uh, that's where I'm going to sit. It'll be the first time I ever saw it. Hmm. Favorite Garth song? Oh, man. Uh, Grew up with that stuff. Colin Baton Rouge, probably one of them. Thunder Rolls is everybody's favorite. Cowboy Lament, I really liked. That's a good question, by the way. Yeah, I'll think of another one before I'm done here. Well, and he told you his favorite. Last thought, let's name drop. Who uh, who is Zach Brown got to meet in Scott Frost's, uh, Frost's office? I don't know. When we have concerts in town, sometimes guys come over. Uh, Zach Brown's been in my office playing my little $80 guitar. Uh, um, we'll see if Garth shows up. It's funny, we met Garth, um, I think in my senior year, he came and uh, talked to the team at practice one day, so... Um, he's one of the best. Can't wait to see him. So he's fired up. Good for Frosty to go uh, see uh, see Garth tomorrow. But you're going or no? I will not be there, no. You're going to no. be serving beer, aren't you? Serving beer, doing that kind of thing. What about you? What are you doing? I have a golf outing tomorrow morning. Oh. Then I don't know. I think I'm just going to hang out of the pool. I love it. Pour drinks. Hey, you know, he talks about Zach Braddon. We were at that show. That was the best. That was awesome. I've seen Zach because he's been here twice, right? Uh, I think he might have been here three times, maybe. So, okay, I saw him in 14. 
in May. It was like a May 25th show. I was there, too. It was great. It was incredible. We had floor seats for that thing. Oh, my God. It was sweet. And then the last time he was here, oh, right, pre-pandemic. It was the last right, couple, right before the, the Right before everything it. went to hell. Yes. Yeah. And you know what? The first February time. February 29th. The first time was better because uh, that night he did Into the Mystic, and he didn't do I, it oh, the last time. So you're a big Into the Mystic guy? Yeah, I love it. I love that song. Oh, it's Van beautiful. Morrison. Yes. 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 Oh, man. We're two step brothers here. We need Zach Brown being back. I call uh, I call Dale. You get Brennan. Okay, I'm fair. Uh, we'll fair. Uh, we'll hear from Derek Peterson coming up. Just a couple news and notes too with uh, Coach Frost on on vaccinations. The team continuing to to make progress uh, when it comes to to team vaccinations. Nobody knows the number there, but uh, that's where things are at. Some NFL on the way. And yes, ranking the top 100 college football coaches, Bill Conley went to work. The window is 50 years. Where does Robert Devaney fall? Where does Coach Tom Osborne fall? And some of those other coaches that you uh, saw come to Memorial Stadium, lots of Saturdays. And some current coaches also in the mix I was disappointed that Gary Barnett did not make the top 100. And then I was reminded that he was four games below 500 for his career. Well, I think I think taking Northwestern to the Rose Bowl after almost getting relegated to the Ivy League should bump him on this list. Derek Peterson's next. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Rick Hibbian on a Friday, Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Without further ado, we are going to play Garth Brooks karaoke with one Derek Peterson, the pride of Oklahoma, our Chicago correspondent at Dr. PDHV on Twitter. Derek, how do the pipes sound? Uh, not good. I'm kidding. And, I will uh, not. I will not do that to you. I just wanted to to, to get that. Thank God. That that, that 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 hold on a minute. What am I walking into? Type reaction. <laughs> What's up, man? What do you know? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm all right. I'm uh, I'm coming down from the slight heart attack. Don't escape me. Don't nobody want to hear me try to sing. And I don't even know any Garth Brooks songs. So yeah. you, really, me in trouble. brother, you you, yep. you 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 know zero Garth being from Oklahoma, which is funny because um, there are uh, oh no never mind no yeah no I don't know anything Garth Brooks. I'm not a big country guy. That's okay. That's fine. Uh, truth be told, I don't really know much either. I know the, I know the Thunder Rolls, and that's about it. And then uh, ro- the ro- Rodeo, and uh, what else? Do you have anything, Willie J? The Rain. Ah, uh, the Pina Colada song. I don't know if Derek can hear that or not. Okay. So we'll get to football in a minute, but <laughs> yeah, it's it's Garth crazy in this town, brother. Yeah, I guess so. Um, it'll be, uh, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens this weekend. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So tight end, are you worried uh, about, uh, this mystery surrounding Nebraska's tight ends? Um, I think we'll, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, because. If their wide receivers are really as talented as Scott Frost and Matt Lubick think they are, um, it shouldn't be a huge problem. I mean, Travis Vokalek doesn't have a ton of production at Nebraska so far. Um, and I, I guess to that end, neither really does Austin Allen. Um, guys were, you know, NFL scouts were there at practice checking out those guys, but those two tight ends don't really move the needle. Um, for, for anybody when you're talking about Nebraska uh, on a national kind of a, a broad mm-hmm. scope, most people don't know who those guys are. Um, so that's part of it. I think, you know, I, I think too, this is, this is a little bit why we're starting to see um, 
some changes to fall camp procedures because it seems like Nebraska has issues getting out of fall camp healthy every single year. Mm-hmm. Um, that's part of it. I, I think, you know, I, I think if I'm not mistaken, they uh, weren't as live during their most recent scrimmage as they were in the first one. Um, I, I bet that's as health related as anything. Mm-hmm. Um, just wanting to, to keep guys upright. Um, I, I don't think I, I don't think we're at a point where you should be worried about the tight ends. I'm not worried about Austin Allen. Um, I like Chris Hickman. I think, you know, the way I, he's coming off of a bad injury, but I think the way that Thomas Fedoni attacked his rehab um, it shows good signs for uh, the, the potential for him to play a role this season, at least later in the year. Um, and I mean, like, if you're missing a guy for the first four weeks of the season, then he's missing the Oklahoma game. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you, you, you move on from there. It's not really, you know, you don't really need all hands on deck for Fordham. You shouldn't need all hands on deck for Fordham. We'll see what happens with Buffalo. Um, Illinois week one, you can kind of get creative with that if you don't have some guys available to you. So I'm not, I'm not terribly concerned, but um, it is a situation where, like, it's like we, we have this conversation every year where, well, <laughs> Nebraska's losing guys at, at uh, inopportune spots. Mm-hmm. Derek Peterson's with us. Hail varsity.com and magazine at Dr. PDHV on Twitter. From a, from a game plan standpoint, though, I look at Vokalek and Allen, uh, point of attack, end line guys. If you wanted to do two more, you know, more double tight end, 22 personnel those guys and kind of set the tone physically against a team in Illinois that, you know, has been physical and, you know, coach Bielham is going to be physical. I just want Nebraska can win a different way, but from a, from a downhill mindset mentality approach, I think this hurts a little bit. I mean, Nebraska can, you're right on. They've got enough wideouts to go spread the field and do their thing, but to to get downhill and, and grind it, I think losing, potentially losing, and we don't know, right? But I'm saying if Vokalek isn't able to go, and uh, if, if he's nicked up, that's that's uh, not good. Now, other guys will have to step up, and uh, they have that opportunity to do so. I just know Vokalek was pretty good uh, last year at point of attack. Yeah, I mean, he's made a, t- a tremendous um, improvement as a blocker mm-hmm. since coming over from, from Rutgers, and and I mean, I just wrote about it last week. Like them having the tight end room that that they have fully healthy is a is a significant schematic advantage. Mm-hmm. Like if you put, um, let's say, Fedoni is fully healthy. If you put Austin Allen and Travis Vokalek and Thomas Fedoni on the field, you feel like at least two of those three guys can block really, really well. Uh, you can throw out of <laughs> formations that have three tight ends on the field. Like you're going to be, uh, you're going to be able to do some stuff with that. And then, you know, we know what Nebraska can do out of, out of empty sets. You can start to um, mess with tendencies quite a bit. So, you know, from, from that standpoint, like, yeah, um, you know, you talk about point of attack. Um, it, it's now, you know, you, you, you're losing a, a blocker that you felt good about. Mm-hmm. So you, you need the other guys in the offensive line to, to really be consistent. And we saw a year ago, that was a, uh, an area that wasn't a, a strong suit. So I, I guess, you know, which kind of been wait and see mode. Let's talk about Savion Morrison. You uh, know Savion well, uh, kid out of Oklahoma. Man, he's really uh, improved his game from the sounds of it. And you know what? What do you like about his game, Derek? What What can he bring to the backfield for Nebraska? I just like the way he runs. Um, I like the way he, he hits holes and attacks. Um, he's you know. I've said this before, and other people, a bunch of people have said it to me, that he runs, you see a little bit of Adrian Peterson when he runs, and um, you know, part of that is just the, the Oklahoma connection, but part of that is, is the stature and, and just the, the way that he hits. Um, you know, there's not a ton of dancing. Um, I think, you know, with, with him and uh, with Marquis Stepp and with Gabe Bourbon, uh, those three guys seem to be probably the, the top three. Um at least that's, that's the way it seems to me. Um, you've got a, a pretty good mix of, of ability and a pretty good um, 
mix of talents there. And I think Savion is one of the the more complete backs that they have in that room. Um, and catching the ball out of the backfield is a big deal. Uh, he's got a, a bigger frame, um, and you know I just I, I think I think he's a really talented back, and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing kind of what he can do with with really what, what will be his first um, real opportunity at the collegiate level after injury and COVID stuff last year. He didn't really get a chance to, to kind of hit the ground running, and, and it seems like he's um, he's kind of showcasing the talent that he's always had now that he's he's got that opportunity. Derek Peterson's with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Uh, Derek, your podcast, the Varsity Club, love it. Love uh, what you do with it. You had a chance to sit down with uh, Adrian Martinez. Man, how was the visit? It was great. Um, Adrian's really cool. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've, I've been really excited about with this NIL experience is, is that we just get to talk to players more about stuff that they enjoy. Um, Adrian's got a podcast. He's really, really good at it. Um, his podcast is really good. They they got uh, episode six, I think, just came out today um, with some guys from the baseball team. Um, he's got a he's got a way of of connecting with the people that are sort of sitting right there. Hello, there with him. And okay, we got you back. You got me back. Yep, keep going. Sorry. Yeah, he's just got a way of getting people to to be comfortable. Um, and you know, that speaks to, um, you know, what we know about Adrian as a leader, he's able to, to bring a team along. And I kind of talked to him a little bit about leadership, just his, his growth, um, as a person and his growth uh, as sort of, you know, he's had to be the guy since day one, the second he stepped on campus. And, and that's a lot to ask of a young kid. That's a lot to ask of a, a first year player coming in and, and having to, to not only figure out, you know, how do I run an offense? How do I do college and football? But also, how do I be the, the face of the team? Um, and, you know, I just think, I, I think the thing that we've probably learned the most about Adrian Martinez over the last 12 months is just that he's just a, a really tremendous human being. Um, and, you know, I know people will, will say what they will about his quarterbacking ability, and, you know, we can certainly um, critique pieces here and there. But, you know, I think um, just his just his nature uh, and the, the person that he is, is, is um, it's a really good thing for Nebraska. Dr. Petey is with us. Derek Peterson, HailVarsity.com and Magazine at Dr. Petey HV on Twitter is where you find him. And the Varsity Club, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, downloaded his sit-down with Adrian uh, Martinez, Nebraska's quarterback. So last thought here, I've got about a minute or so, Derek, but – with with the weapons around Adrian that we think are there and maybe somebody emerging at running back, do you think the balance can be better uh, on offense for Nebraska? I know they've always kind of traditionally been run heavy, but I'm looking for some maybe some, some year one Adrian type uh, success with the play action. Do you think that possibility exists for this offense? Yeah, I absolutely think the possibility exists. Um, when you talk about balance, the first thing that pops into my head is is having a, a more stable um, traditional ground game that isn't almost wholly reliant on the quarterback uh, to move the ball on the ground. Um, that would certainly help. And, you know, I, I've said it a bunch this offseason. We just talked about it a little bit ago when we were talking about the tight ends. I like the wide receiver talent. Um, I think it's good. They obviously think it's as good as it has been since they've been here. But, um, you know, the thing that I keep coming back to this offseason is everything revolves around the offensive line and how consistent they are up front. They're going to have two really young tackles on the outside going against um, a league that has a lot of, of really good edge rushers. And they've got a center that um, so far has been inconsistent um, at best, snapping the football for stretches. And so for them to, to show balance, for them to be able to have the time um, to take shots downfield, for them to be able to get the ground game uh, moving more effectively, that offensive line has to be super consistent. I think they have uh, the talent to do it. I think I think Greg Austin's done a good job with that group. Um, but this is uh, this is a really important year for, for the offensive line. Derek, have a good weekend, man. We'll check in next week. Thanks for jumping on with us, bud. Sounds good, buddy. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you. There he is, Derek Peterson. We'll talk top hundred coaches next. Chime in, 402. 
888-346-8466 ESPN or email the show Chris at HaleVarsity.com Just try me, try me Back to Hale Varsity Radio Thanks for spending time. Happy Friday. It's Hale Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Bill Dolman, 25 minutes away. Thanks to Derek Peterson from Hale Varsity. Joining us uh, last segment, and then Jay Moore with us in the 5 o'clock hour. Pretty awesome stuff from uh, Hastings. They got the dub, and they got the dub over Iowa. The 1-1. One, one. Good end it. Charging. By Jude Johnson. Oh, baby! Snow cone in right, and Hastings is going to the Little League World Series. The pride of Hastings, right there. Jude Johnson, well done, man. Never been to Williamsport. Uh, let's just be straight. I wasn't a good enough baseball player to make a team that could get to Williams Williamsport. Uh, we did that whole uh, Schmidt year. Your mother and father paid, so you have to play. Uh, so we'll stick you in right field. I've been there, done that, man. <laughs> oh, but uh, who is the big heavy set lefty uh, for the Yanks? Goatee. God, he threw a perfect game. Big old fat nasty. I loved him. David something or other. Ugh. David Wells. David Wells, big sexy. <laughs> I did my, my best David Wells, except I was a righty through the junior high years. Okay, yeah. Through the junior high years. So let's talk coaches' rankings. Bill Conley out with a, another list. And Bill Conley, good college football writer. Uh, that's an understatement. But he put his top 100 together. Uh, an enemy of the state, Bruce Snyder, head coach at Arizona State, got a little ticked off when uh, an Australian Husker football player did a backflip, was ticked off at T for throwing while they were up by 1,000 in 1995. That led to well, a lot of emphasis being put on the Arizona State-Nebraska game in 96 when Bill Snyder still had a – Bruce Snyder, beg your pardon, Bruce Snyder still had a job at Arizona State. And uh, long and short, he he just sneaks in at uh, number 101. I said the top 100 coaches. Uh, Frank Beamer was left off this list originally. So uh, it's now 101. Let's get to the the nitty-gritty, though, with uh, where some of your favorite coaches rank. And uh, Bobby Petrino is right in front, motorcycle and all of uh, Frank Solich. So Solich comes in at number 78. Bobby Petrino in at 77. Butch Davis, what a glorious run at Miami. Uh, and then uh, John Blake got him in trouble at Carolina. He's now at, was at Florida International. Kirk Ferentz, I didn't know Captain Kirk spent time in the Maine wilderness, but he did before joining uh, the uh, the Belichick staff in Cleveland, Iowa, of course, so you have Ferentz in at number 71. Joe Tiller, I love Joe Tiller. Wyoming and Purdue comes in at 68. Your top 50. Uh, Phil Fulmer comes in at 49. D'Antonio, 48. Lance Leopold, <laughs> now at Buffalo, uh, from Buffalo to Kansas, 146 and 39. <laughs> We're talking multiple national championships at Whitewater. He comes in at 46. Uh, moving down the list, the Pirate, our dear friend Mike Leach, comes in at 41. Bill McCartney. This is what they say about Wild Bill. Colorado finished in the AP Top 10 just twice ever before. The former Michigan assistant transformed the Buffs into an option-heavy powerhouse. He enjoyed three 11-win seasons, first emanating uh, rival Nebraska, then briefly surpassing Nebraska before Nebraska uh, put him out like a smoky treat. Daddy Ford in at 39. Dennis Erickson in at number 38. Uh, Coach Kelly in at 30, eh, 35. Make that 36 for for Brian Kelly for the Notre Dame fans out there. Barry Alvarez comes in at 32. Bo Schembechler, 29. Gary Patterson still gets some love at 28. Bob Stoops at number 26. Is that way high for big game Bob? Resurrected Oklahoma. Let's be straight. Resuscitated Oklahoma. Won a championship in 2000. 
But here's the thing. How bad did they get after Switzer? Uh, real bad. I mean, they had Gary Gibbs for a couple of years, but Gary was not on TV for two years because of probation. <sighs> And then they, they whacked him. But he was, I mean, Gibbs is going eight or nine and three, eight and four. Huh. But then they go get Howard Schnellenberger, and then they go get John Blake, and then they, they get Stoops. Wow. They had about a 10-year window where they were not good at all. Don James comes in at number 22. Uh, the last 50 years, you have Chris Peterson and Lou Holtz, Daryl Royal at 18. Woody Hayes at 16, Trestle 15, Carroll 14, Spurrier 13, uh, Joe Pa at 11, Lavelle Edwards 10, Switzer in at 9. Question about Edwards there at 10. Is is BYU only a thing because of him? They were, yeah, I mean, he got there in 72. He won 257 games, won a title in 84. Jim McMahon, Steve Young, Robbie Bosco. Huh. Sarkeesian went to a Cotton ah, Bowl. I okay. mean, they he, I mean, he, they were kind of quarterback you. Interesting. Uh, Mark Wilson. So you had Switzer at nine, Bill Snyder eight. Am I not seeing Devaney on this list? I, I think he must be before the where, where they started ranking his. Yeah, because Bob started in 62, which is clearly beyond the last 50 years. So, well, I mean, you had John McKay in at number six. I think he was like right behind. Maybe just a few years off of being in this thing. Dude, Devaney, no, there's other coaches from, from his era that Interesting. made it. Maybe um, they coached longer? Ten years? Huh. I mean, Bob had, Bob had uh, close to 100 wins. I think he had 101, something like that. We've got to scan this list a little further because this is glorious radio. I can't find Devaney. I, I'm telling. I looked earlier. I don't see him on here. He's not on here. <laughs> That's not good. Again, like I don't know what the how you're qualified to be in this ranking. It, is it last fifty years? Let's rank the top one hundred coaches the past fifty years. Why fifty years? Primarily because the sport approached full integration fifty years ago. So. One final note here. The list is completely and totally about on-field accomplishments. You'll see plenty of coaches on this list who ran into trouble with the NCAA. I wrote about 50 men in particular, but I wanted to take uh, the time to mention as many awesome coaches as possible. So I have Devaney leaving Nebraska in 72, 72. and that was 60 years ago. 72 would have been 49. Oh, maybe my calculator's wrong. My bad, Smitty. No, you're good. You're good. I, I'm kind of shocked that Devaney's not on here because you got yeah, you're Dan right. Devine, Missouri, and, and Notre Dame. And Dan Devine first started coaching at Arizona State in 55. I'm with you, Smitty. He should be, he should be on there. <laughs> yeah? You launch a program? Woody Hayes is on here. He started coaching in 46. That's incredible that Devaney isn't on this list. Wow. Wow. T.O. comes in at number four. Bobby Bowden, three. Bear Bryant, two. Saban in at number one. I get that Frank Beamer was left off the list and then added. Somebody's got to ask old Conley where, where sweet old Bob's at. We'll wind down hour one on Hale Varsity. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. So, great research, poor prep on my end. Bill Conley answering a couple of different questions here on Osborne being too low on the list at number four. So, Conley's response is like, look, Osborne v. Bowden, that had him stumped for a while. It ended up leaning Bowden because he didn't inherit as much. That's fair. So, to build from scratch is really tough. To follow a legend that won two championships played for four in a 10-year window, and then maintain and exceed is even tougher. Are you going to wreck the Ferrari, or are you going to trade in the Ferrari for two Porsches and a Lambo? (laughs) Right? How do you look at it? But Conley's response is uh, he retired the year 
the range of the list began, so from 70 beyond. So Conley, his approach with this top 100 coaches, you needed the coach like at least till 1975. Okay. Which, I mean, that that explains it. Thanks for the uh, shout out from the uh, folks at... uh, the Go Big Redcast, their they're money. They're part of the Herdad Media family. Hug them, listen to them, uh, check their podcast out. Do but, you put Devaney in, in front of anyone in the top ten there? I mean, Oh, hell yes. I mean, the top ten's good, and rightfully so, and maybe I've had a little red Kool-Aid today. <laughs> but Joe Paterno should be off the list. There I said that. Okay. Lavelle Edwards, yes, Devaney, for sure. In front. Uh, do I put Devaney in front of Switzer? I do. Okay. I put Devaney in front of Bill Snyder. I put Devaney in front of Sweeney. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I put Devaney in front of Bear just because Bear won a thousand titles. Here's the thing that Devaney did that all these guys in front of him, aside from Osborne and Sabin, didn't do. And, and Osborne and Saban never got busted, nor nailed, nor cheated. Okay? Bobby Bowden had problems. Florida State used to stand for free shoes you. Mm. God rest his soul. His funeral's tomorrow, so I'm not hating. Sure. Uh, Bear Bryant went on probation a lot. Really? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. There's a few six and five seasons. Uh, Barry Switzer. I love Switzer to death. Went on probation a lot. Mm. Urban Meyer. Bob Devaney didn't have sudden flare-ups with health issues. When I'm going eight and five and Saban's crushing me. John McKay, USC. Really good coach. USC was not awesome. Bill Snyder is is a tough call because I mean the guy again went mouth to mouth and gave K-State life twice. He's incredible. Yeah. He's absolutely incredible. But no, Devaney belongs in the top 10 because he took a program that was horrid, non-existent, and then out of the gate made it really awesome. Hmm. And then, oh, by the way, was smart enough to pick Tom Osborne, who he hired. And then T.O. did his thing. But Saban and Bear, I mean, those those year one, two. The thing that's, that, that Osborne did, that, that most of these guys on this list in this top ten didn't have to deal with is, I mean, they all recruited nationally, but they had a ton of backyard talent. Coach Osborne had talent around the vicinity, but he was so good at developing and, and thriving with his system. Incredible. Bill Dolman's on the way with Hale Varsity. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to an hour two. It's Hale Var City Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Will Wilson, as uh, we dive in, he is going to get the guitar out, clear his voice, and probably sing along. We welcome in the pride of Fairbury, NBC Sports. Bill Dolman with us. Billy D. It's uh, Garth Brooks weekend. How are you? I appreciate the wake up call. Uh, so good morning to everybody. <laughs> You're back from the Olympics, and uh, man, are your feet tired? And as is your alarm clock. Yeah, I, I, I told people I was doing stuff. You know, I worked at a, the Connecticut headquarters, the mothership of NBC. So we were doing stuff uh, tomorrow from Tokyo today for later yesterday there. Mm. And you finally, you know, you, you come home, and uh, it, it's been a it's been a bit of an adjustment to to try and get back to uh, back to life. But anyway, so we need to to discuss something on Facebook. Uh huh. Bring it. Field of Dreams. You have never seen it. I've never seen it, and I found out last night from uh, Coach uh, Riles that there's a book, which I've also never read. 
and apparently the music was good enough to be nominated for some award. So <laughs> didn't read it, didn't see it, didn't hear it. Now, I've got a friend of mine that posted uh, uh, that said he didn't believe me that I was just playing a little game on Facebook. And I said, I am 100, 1 billion percent truthful that I have not seen Field of Dreams. And I would go higher than 1 billion percent, but I don't think that's mathematically possible. So are you going to see it? Uh, I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> I barely watched the game last night. I tuned it in, and these guys are playing baseball by corn, and everybody was making a big deal out of it. And I also said that anybody who played Legion ball in small town Nebraska has pretty much played about half the games of your season next to a cornfield, so I really don't see what the big deal is. Well, Hastings whacked Iowa to get to the uh, Little League World Series today. I saw that. A great catch uh, at, the, at the end to close it out. So. The, I think Jude Johnson, I think that's the, the young lad's name, making a gold glove effort out in right field. Yep. Yep, so uh, so go bigger. The kids were wearing red too, as I recall. Yes, so, uh, go big, little reds, right? That, maybe that, those kids. Maybe those kids will watch Field of Dreams. I, I don't know. I've not seen it. They, I've not seen. They've the seen it. They've they've already <laughs> seen it multiple times. I'm sure it was on the team bus. But <laughs> what, 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 how would you have reacted though? Had you seen Kevin Costner roll out of the corn in a Ripken jersey? Uh, probably would not have moved me uh, all that much. So it's the inside joke about Cal Ripken and, and, and anywho, never mind. <laughs> no comment. That's no why it would not have moved me all that much. No comment about the old Cal Ripken and Kevin Costner, urban legend. Okay. Uh, so you haven't seen field of dreams. You are mildly interested in, in baseball in the corn last night. Are you are you gearing uh, no, up for football at least? And by the way, by, by the way, and I've never seen an episode of Law and Order. Real, uh, oh, dude! I've never seen an episode dude. of Criminal Minds. I've never seen an episode of NCIS. I've never seen an episode of uh, Breaking Bad, Dexter. Uh, you name all the Ben shows, but I no, I've never I've never seen Field of Dreams. I didn't see the, the what's the crying in baseball movie. I haven't seen that one. That one didn't move me to, to go watch. So uh, <laughs> I yeah, told I've you, never Will, seen, he's I have got never a seen Russian a flag Dreams. above his mantle. What do you watch for enjoyment, Bill? Huh? What do you watch for uh, enjoyment? Look, Waz Junior. When 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 I <laughs> when you when you're saving the world through sports casting. You know, you, you have steely-eyed focus and determination on the task at hand. And when I've got to bring my best information about Korean archers, um, uh, Brazilian shooters, mm-hmm. German w- women beating horses on the head in modern pentathlon, you can't waste your time watching Kevin Costner movies. Although I thought Draft Day was actually pretty good, and he's done a pretty good job of rebuilding the uh, the Cleveland Browns around... Uh, uh, Baker. Uh, no, uh, Brian Drew. Right. That's yeah. Because he was at a birthday party mm-hmm. instead right. of hanging with his teammates. Right. right. So that was a good pick. <laughs> Monte Mac, no matter what. So you're going to want to go get an RV once you watch Breaking Bad. Uh, just giving you, <laughs> <laughs> just just giving you a heads up there. Well, watch Field of Dreams. You'll enjoy it, and it'll make you smile. It makes me smile. But there's there's a movie or two I have I have not seen that I think the rest of the world seen. Uh, most of it has to do with you know what you take your kids to, and Junior's favorite movie is Major League. So we started out of the gate with uh, high quality Lou Brown uh, when it came to baseball movies. Husker football, Bill. Uh, we're two weeks away from tomorrow with Nebraska, Illinois, and interested here with uh, with you know if you're Scott Frost, what you do if maybe you're down. And we don't know for sure if he is or not, but if you're down one of your tight ends with how you approach, uh, you know, your philosophy, if you want to go ground and pound and and be heavy, are you still going to be able to do that uh, without uh, without a Vokalek? And we don't know he's out. I'm just saying that backups are having to be used now because you've got a guy that's, as Coach Frost put it today, nicked up. Well, I, I think it's it's – I think it's a critical position for Nebraska just based on what we've learned over the last uh, what three or four recruiting cycles in terms of the emphasis that they seem to be putting on bringing in athletic tight ends mm-hmm. that can stretch the field. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed the days when it was uh, Chris Garrett and Will Washington being, you know, guys who couldn't be offensive linemen necessarily, but well, actually they could be offensive linemen, 
They just happen to have better hands. Sure. So they could actually be tight ends. Um, I think I think it's probably pretty critical that they uh, that one of those guys is back. And it, from what I'm reading over the last 24 hours, it sounds like Vokalek, uh, the you know the, the red uh, the red lights not quite on, the sirens aren't blaring for him like they are um, for uh, the other guy. Shoot, Austin name, Allen. Name, Austin Allen. Thank you very much. 18 catches and all that. Mm-hmm. But I think it's a critical uh, you know it's it's critical for Nebraska that they that they have guys that are healthy that have experience at that position you know, you're moving i can't keep track of the number of times i think i've read chris hickman changing positions going from a to b to a to c to a to b again um so i'm sure that kid's probably a little bit confused but all of this as i read it the thing that comes to my mind though is is what i've talked about i think for the past you know several weeks and maybe since the spring game it's all going to be predicated on the depth on the offensive line and i think that's the most important thing for nebraska all year is that you have two deep from left tackle to left guard to center to right to right tackle. And it, if Nebraska doesn't have the tight ends that can block with experience, then, you know, running between the tackles is going to be critical because you probably can't get outside. Um, and how much they can stretch the field in the pass game, I don't know. But, uh, again, I think the offensive line becomes even more critical if the op- if those tight ends aren't, uh, they don't have experience at the tight end position to block when they need to. I'm not worried about tight ends catching the ball. Mm-hmm. I'm more worried about them being able to block the perimeter. Hey Amen. That's where I'm at. If you want to really set the tone and, and be downhill and be physical, uh, you need that point of attack. And you've got a couple of good ones in Vokalek and, and Allen. And it's not to say that, that Hickman and guys behind those uh, those two perceived starters can't get the job done, but they're just much younger and they're different body types than six nine and six 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 eight, and you know two seventy or or two you know two fifty five. Bill Dolman's with us, the pride of Fairbury, NBC Sports, Alvar City Radio. Bill, when we talked Nebraska Illinois in that opener, what what was the most tense opener you remember uh, with with your coverage or your your time with Nebraska, either covering or working for? Well. <laughs> Getting Bob Devaney to the meeting with uh, Walt Byers from the NCAA in 19 what 86, so that uh, they could have that meeting, and 40 or 50 players would be eligible to play on ABC that night against uh, uh, that Saturday night against Florida State. So that was uh, most critical, given the fact that the meeting was at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and uh, and I he landed at the airport at about 3:10. So that was probably the most tense, and that's of course when he asked for the keys and drove us back from the airport to uh, Memorial Stadium. Uh, Devaney so drove was, you back? Yeah, that was, the, you know, they had the meeting. After and, uh, being said, on an airplane? Uh, well, I said, Coach, uh, I, I went out to go pick him up, and the meeting was at 3, and it was like 3.10, and he's coming down the escalator. I said, Coach, I'm, you know, Bill from the SID office, uh, you know, here to take you back. He goes, uh, I said, by the way, you, you had a meeting scheduled with, uh, with, I'm pretty sure it was Walt Byers, who was the president of the NCAA at the time. And I said, you had a meeting at 3 o'clock, and it's already past 3, so we need to get you back as quick as possible. And he says, uh, why don't you give me the keys? I believe, I believe you better let me drive this time. So that's when we went on our joyride down Corner Square Highway to get back to uh, Memorial Stadium for the uh, for the meeting. And, you know, probably because they made a, me, uh, because I and Ben Boyle had made our, our required trips to N Street, uh, they had enough libations to get the deal done, and Nebraska played, and I think we won that game. So, you know, that was a pretty tense uh, season opener. Bill Dolman delivering for the Big Red N. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's. Did you have a list that you needed to go shopping for? Or was it memorized? <laughs> no, I didn't have to go shop. It was all like prepackaged already. Oh, I'm sure so, it was the good stuff. Oh yeah, this. What's that over there? That's for Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Need a bag? Yes. <laughs> Brown paper sack. So Dolman, you delivered the the comeback victory against Florida State, or did they win? Uh, or, or did I, I, Florida State win that night? No, I, th- I think we won that night. I, as I recall, that wasn't the eighteen fourteen Jeff Quinn fumble at the eleven. That was a night game, like it was like eighty six. I think they beat Nebraska in eighty five, though, didn't they, or something like that? Yeah, they, they had a win there. That was kind of the one that you know that that really launched Bobby Bowden's you know career uh, was that win over uh, over Nebraska and. and but I think it was that night game. It was a it was a prime time game. The one that they the game that they won and upset that was 
you know, that was Florida State coming to get a check. In 1980, uh, they, yeah. Yeah, they, were, they weren't established. But, you know, by, by, the, you know, by the time five years had rolled around, you know, those were the, you know, two of the marquee programs in college football, and that was the primetime uh, kickoff to the season. And, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure we won that game. I think Steve Taylor was the quarterback mm-hmm. at the time. Uh, um, but, uh, but anyway, so, yeah, that was, that was a pretty tense, uh, tense opener, as I recall. Getting Bob Devaney for, to for, meet for the different NCAA. reasons. Yes. for different reasons other than uh, you know, was that a good game? Or, you know, was it a tough opponent? Eligibility. Or not? We're talking about <laughs> eligibility and the the old uh, scandal with the uh, selling of student tickets and Bill, making sure that and making sure that the cupboard was stocked. Yeah. We'll just keep yeah. pouring until he says it's okay, Bob. <laughs> 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 Man, I, yeah, uh, the, the walls can talk. Uh, that's that's so good. Bill Dolman's with us. Bill, I sent you Bill Conley's list, his top 100 coaches. We were in a little bit of an uproar that Devaney was not on this list, but Conley cleared up that he had to, to coach at least till 1975, so that's why Bob's left off. And some other coaches like Woody Hayes and and uh, and Shen Beckler and and uh, who's the guy for USC? Uh, John, 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 John McKay. Uh, John McKay. Yeah. Yeah, they're on there because they coached at least the mid seventies. But T.O. comes in at number four. Uh, Bowden three, Bryant two, Saban one. Uh, your take on this top four? Well, it's clearly a one man's opinion, a uh, pretty good opinion, but they didn't leave it to a vote because if they put it up to a vote, you know, Nebraska fans would have uh, flooded the uh, the ESPN mailbag, and Tom Osborne would have been number one. Like I think it, 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 I think it's reasonably accurate to say that. Although I'm always amused because I don't think Tom ever lost to Nick Saban. I uh, could be wrong on that, but I don't ever recall that happening. Um, in fact, I think when we played there at, at Michigan State in 1995, I think it was, you know, 42 to, to nothing or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, but now, I don't think you can argue that, the, you know, the rest of the world is going to put Nick Saban atop the list. Uh, Bear Bryant um, belongs with that group of, you know, Bob Devaney and McKay and, you know, dare you say Paterno, Woody Hayes. I mean, there's some there's some guys with some uh, dark check marks uh, next to them. But, you know, those are the pioneers who built this, who built the game into what it is today. So you certainly don't want to leave them off of a, a, a list of the top coaches of all time, because without them, the game isn't where it is now. Um, so I, I'm, I'm glad that you had a, uh, a conversation about Bob Devaney in that regard. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think there's any question that Tom belongs in the, the elite level of that list. And Bobby Bowden was a great quote. <laughs> and he was a great coach. There's no doubt about it. But he was media friendly, knew how to play the media. Um, Bear Bryant had all the power in the world, and he mm-hmm. dictated where everybody went and played their bowl games, and Saban is Saban. So for, for Tom to be in the top four or five, I think, uh, speaks to the reverence people have for who he was or who he is, who he was as a coach and everything that he brought to the game. And, you know, one of the great things I think about Tom Osborne that really gets – that people do not talk about, and I've said this about Turner Gill being the most important recruit in Nebraska football history, but Tom made a major shift really twice during an already great coaching career, going from, you know, a, a, a past pro-style offense with Vince Ferragamo and Dave Hom and those guys in the 70s to the option – uh, that was a major shift. And then in the 90s, you know, the shift defensively. Um, those, are, those are seismic changes that had great impacts on Nebraska football to keep Nebraska football among the prominent programs in the country and created a dynasty. Bill, you made a shift when you're already winning 10 games. Think about that. Yeah, that, and, and that's – and. You know, seeing the writing on the wall, well, I shouldn't say seeing the writing on the wall, because Nebraska would have continued to have been successful. Mm-hmm. But just major, <laughs> to go from a, a pro style to the option, mm-hmm. uh, to beat your arch rival in Oklahoma, which he did, and then deciding, you know what, we got to make some changes defensively and, and become faster uh, with Ed Stewart and, and moving that that. Uh, you know, making him a, a a speedy linebacker and everything that you know transpired after that. I just, I just really, when you look back, not many coaches have the uh, wherewithal to to do that and 
uh, check their pride and figure out, okay, what do we need to do to even be more successful? And he did it. Bill Dolman with us, pride of Fairbury, NBC Sports. Billy D, we'll check in next week. Thanks so much for jumping in today. And I'm guessing Tom didn't waste his time watching Field of Dreams to get the job done. When you're saving the world through sports casting and coaching Husker football, you know, you got to sacrifice things. <laughs> Take care. Get get it rented. Go, go Big Red. Varsity Radio. Back to you, Tail Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Black shirt, Husker, NFLer, Jay Moore with us, and he's co-host of Big Red Wrap-Up. Jay Bird, you dust off the cowboy boots for this weekend? <laughs> uh, I do not own a pair of cowboy boots, um, and I'm totally happy with that. Uh, I will not be at uh, the golf concert. That's not my uh, – I'm a fan of country music, but uh, – not that country, you know. Okay. I know about the name of two Garth, two Garth Brooks songs, and uh, so, you know, uh, I'll, I'll. I hope people have a good time. I think it's great that hopefully there's a ton of people there and people enjoy themselves. But uh, I'll be, I'll, I'll be in Lincoln, but I, I won't be at the Garth Brooks concert. That's all right. What, what was the like? Your, your buddy Barrett Rude. I mean, he's he's a yeah. big he's a big like cowboy boot guy, isn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. Barrett, Barrett will rock the cowboy boots. You know, he's like, you know, people say like, if you get a good pair of cowboy boots and you get them broken in, like, you won't find a more comfortable pair of shoes. Really? Which I have to call like total BS on that. I mean, those look like <laughs> the most uncomfortable things ever. But you know, to each their own. So um, yeah, I just can't do them. I can't. You know, maybe you know for a, maybe a Halloween costume or something, but you know what? Wow. I, you know, if I'm going to wear any shoes, I'm wearing, you know, some nice... You're going you know, to Adidas on, or Nike you know, or something. dress shoes that have, like, some technology in them that are going to protect my feet, mm-hmm. you know? I, I don't need, you know, as cool as you can make, like, ostrich leather and, what you know, and whatever it is. Um, I'm going to go with something a little more to my style. Well, Billy Martin would always wear cowboy boots. Uh, you could pull off a Doc Holiday. Uh, if you ever wanted to dress up as Doc Holliday for Halloween and yeah. and grow a stash, you get a little handle. Is he a handlebar guy? I don't think he was handlebar, but it was bar. It, it it looked uh, it looked aerodynamic. I'll go there. Okay. I'll Jay Moore's right. with us. Jay, so football's around the corner. Do you believe it's two weeks till till kickoff, man? Oh, I can't. You know, it's summer is uh, summer has flown by. You know, it's nice. It's good. It, I'm glad it's. It's around the corner, and I'm, I'm just hoping that uh, you know the, the the guys' minds are right, and they're in the right place, and they know the opportunity that's hand, and I, that, that starts with everyone from the top top down. That uh, you know, this is you know, all games are important, but it feels like this first one is you know almost the biggest game of the season. I, I think if you approach every game like it's the biggest game of the season, you'll be all right. But this is a big one. You get up to to a wrong start. Um, you know, this the season could look could look vastly different. Mm-hmm. I know it's a it's a grind of a schedule, but you know, go to Illinois. You got uh, you got a new coach, but they got a lot of returning players back that uh, played some good football last year. So, yeah, it's it's close. You know, I, I I'm happy that it's still two weeks away because I think this team needs to get as prepared as possible to go out to Champaign and and start taking care of business like they need to start doing. But uh, yeah, it's, it's it's definitely gone by quick this summer. That's all right. Jay Moore is with us. Few minutes, Hale Varsity Radio. Jay, at what point in your career and your maturation process as a as a player, as a student athlete, did did the the day to day really become important for that Saturday when it come when it comes to your prep, when it comes to your film study, when it comes to knowing your assignments? Uh, where, where did that kind of click on for you, or or was it always that way? No, no, it, it, it took me some time. You know, I, you know, in high school, you just show up and you, and you, and you practice and you play. And in high school, you're always pretty much better than everyone. So, you don't, I mean, not that I didn't work hard, but, you know, you mm-hmm. have to pay really that much attention to detail, right? You know, you rarely watch film. You might watch film for maybe an hour a week, you know, on the, on the opponent because, you know, it's hard to get back then, you know, VCR tapes and just finding, you know, it was, it's, it was a little more difficult, but you get to college and you know, you're all bright eyed and bushy tailed. But I, like I tell people, my first couple of years were like trying to take a drink out of a fire hydrant. You know, mm-hmm. it was, it was difficult. You just try to take in what you could. And then eventually things started to slow down. And I honestly, you know, once I started playing my sophomore year, like 
I told you before, I was just really happy playing. You know, I was finally playing. I was, you know, on the two deep. You know, I played every game, played tons of snaps. You know, I started a bunch of games my sophomore year. I was contributing. That was that was that was a step, right? But I still wasn't fully approaching it like you know, you, like you might say a pro or um, an all conference player would. And that really didn't happen until my until the very next year to where you know, you start understanding how to dissect film. So, you know, that's my junior year. You know, I was really able to approach it. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, you know, working hard. My, I mean, you're so busting your ass, right? But, mm-hmm. you know, it's just doing the little things. It's, it's approaching every rep in practice like a game rep. You know, sometimes you find yourself, you know, my sophomore year, you're just, you're, you're just trying to get through practice, you know, instead of making the practices count, you know. And, and we're in a new transition, so... You know, things were crazy, you know, going from Solis to Callahan. So I think everyone was, was a little, it was a little, you know, almost like you're playing with two left feet sometimes. But, you know, I, I my junior year is when I finally approached it and I kind of matured more mentally and understood the film. But it was really just kind of breaking down practice, you know, and, and, and practicing like it was a game and not trying to get through and making sure I was trying to be as perfect as possible. So I knew if I was perfect – as, as close as possible, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday became that much easier and I was that much better and I'd play better. And all of a sudden you start playing better and producing and you're getting sacks and TFLs and tip balls and you're winning football games and you're beating good opponents. That becomes, those results become really addicting and uh, you make sure you do that every week. So it took me, it took me a few years um, to, to really get there. But, uh, you know, I think everyone's a little different. Jay Moore's with us, Hale Varsity Radio, getting ready for Nebraska. Is a couple of weeks away from the opener at Illinois. We are on the road in Champaign. Road shows Friday and Saturday with Hale Varsity Radio. And then uh, Real Red Reaction, of course, uh, on the way following. So, Jay Bird, a, a take here on this defensive line. I know that there's bodies. I know that there's rotation. I know there's some experience. There's young. There's old. There's in between. And let's talk ceiling here for this defensive line. I think their their best trait, and you you jump in as the expert, is their ability to stop the run. I think they're physical, but when it comes to to pressure and being uh, being able to to affect the quarterback, I think that's what the next step is. Is there a guy or two that you think has the ability that can go all right from just run stuffer to? to quarterback chaser is there a couple of guys that can really have a breakout year yeah I, I think the first guy that comes to my mind is is ty robinson you know i think he possesses all the tools to be you know one of the next best defensive linemen to come out of come out of uh, nebraska you know he has the height the strength uh, athleticism um you know he has the you know, I just remember seeing him play against Wisconsin his true freshman year. You know, we were able to play four games, and he was in the goal line. He was, you know, he was, you know, but impressing guys. And Wisconsin has, you know, some real men on their offensive line. I'm like, whoa, that's pretty impressive. So I, I think, you know, he's he's a guy that I think could, should be an every down guy, you know. And then, you know, I think another guy that, so that's more your interior guy. I think it's, I, I'd like to say, you know, a guy like, you know, he's an outside linebacker, but you, I, I think you, he'll play on the edge. You know, a guy like Caleb Tanner. I okay. think you want to talk about a guy who can be, be an ever-down guy and set the edge against the run. And, and then when it comes to that, you know, obvious, you know, third and long situation, you know, he's got to be able to win. You know, he, has, he possesses all the tools, and that's just the thing that you've already hit it. Like, that's the thing Nebraska's kind of miss is you having a dude that can uh, – that can win on third down. You know, we haven't had a guy like that since, you know, Randy was here, Randy Gregory. And so hopefully those two guys pick it up. But, you know, there's there's a bunch of guys still. You know, you'd, you'd like to think Ben Stilley, you know, going into his, what, sixth year would be able to evolve more and, and be an all-down all, all down guy and, and create some pressure. And I think, you know, they'll move Ben when he gets into, you know, third and long situations. He might play over a center or a guard instead of over a tackle. Sometimes – his athleticism to be able to beat those guys. So they get pretty afraid of what they have. But, you know, I, I look at those two guys who it's like, hey, you know, hey, Ty, you're like, hey, let's go. Let's go, Ty, now. And, you know, he's going into his, his third year, which I think is always the most, uh, not important, but I think that's just a year when guys really can, can step out of their shell and, and start doing some good things. And I, you know, I think Caleb is either going to his third or fourth. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. So 
those two guys need to, uh, you know, they've been playing good football, but, you know, sometimes good football, you know, isn't, you know, they need better than good mm-hmm. this year. You know, they, they need great out of those guys. So hopefully you can, can uh, take it up a notch. Jay Moore's with us. Hail Varsity Radio, Blackshirt Husker NFLer. Jay, we'll, uh, we'll figure things out uh, as, as teams go through bumps and bruises and injuries. And, you know, talk to me a little bit here about Nebraska's offense. And I think they've wanted to, to use two tight ends, and they can still do that. But if, if injuries creep up and there's – uh, an issue with uh, with availability here, you know, th- is Nebraska going to be okay to to do something different uh, with what they want to do with their offense? There, there's a plan to, to lean heavy on the tight ends and the run in the pass game. If if your top two targets aren't healthy, let's just walk down that hypothetical as we talk. Sure. Uh, you know what, what? What do you do going into Illinois and beyond? Uh, let's. I mean, Nebraska's got a got a way to and the ability to spread out. But man, I was kind of I had a hankering for a double tight eye formation. Yeah, you know that's, that's you know having some options, and I think you know adapting to the Big Ten um, is as you know you're going into year four. I mean. You, you can obviously, it's nice to have the option to, to spread out and, and do some of those things, but you know, it's, it's, you know, you, but it's also great to be able to get up and like, you know, two tight ends, you know, an I formation, you know, we call that 22 personnel, right? Mm-hmm. Two best, two tight, two tight ends and, and just say, Hey, <laughs> Hey, Illinois, Hey, Iowa, Hey, Wisconsin, Hey, you know, Purdue, we're coming at you, you know, and then we're going to hit you hard and then guess what? Boom, we're going to take some play action and, we're going to maybe hit a both leg or Austin Allen and, and, and then, or, you know, get Xavier Betts, you know, lined up one-on-one with someone because you got, you know, eight guys in the box to take on this, take on this formation or, or, you know, whoever it may be. Um, so yeah, it's, it's nice to have that creativity. And I think you just have to have it. I think there's some time where, you know, crunch time, where you know, it's a, it's, it's a four minute drill, right? Mm-hmm. Where you, you're up and you just got to get a couple first down and you don't need to be in shotgun spread formation, you know, and, and going quick. You need to be snapping that ball with two seconds on the play clock and eating that thing down and getting three, four yards of chunk and letting this thing run out so you can, you can get out of dodge a win against tough big kind of opponents. So that's just the way big kind of football is. So I think that's just a maturation of this offense and the staff and understanding that where, you know, Frost said, hey, people, you know, hopefully, you know, people in the Big Ten have to adapt to us. But I think it's probably the opposite. I think this staff has to adapt to the Big Ten and just realize it's a lot harder than what you think in winning in, in the Pac-12 and, and in the, or the AAC. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, they're adapting, and I think it's great to have. you got to have some creativity. You can spread them out. But you know what? You know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's great to just break the defense will when you, <laughs> you can't stop it. And we've been on, we, you know, the rest have been on the opposite end of that where we literally cannot stop off a nosebleed in the run game. And, um, it'd be nice to start doing that to some other opponents. He's in his 30s, but sounds like he was born with a stogie in one hand and a brew in the other. Now, say my name. It's Schmitty on Hail Varsity Radio. I got the body of a taut, pre-teen Swedish boy. Jay Moore is with us. Hail Varsity Radio. Jay, last thought. Uh, Will Compton, sit down with Bo Pelini on uh, Bussin' with the Boys. We, we've had a good time uh, going over that here this week. And do, do you have a funny Bo story? And, and two, to that, I thought a really good part of the interview was, was Will talking about, you know, how Bo just, when, it, when, when, when bleep hit the fan, it compounded and and there was not a calming voice in all your time in football what coach i guess sticks out to you the most about handling those pressure moments the best is there a coach that you still kind of smile about saying man it was a tight ball game we were it was a dog fight and and this coach was super calm did did you have a good experience with those moments yeah i mean you know I, this is tough. I mean, I don't think I can't really think of any, but I mean, the, the coach, 
so my time in San Diego NFL, you know, it was, you know, I was there with Mike Nolan drafting me, then mm-hmm. going into my second year, he was fired, and Mike Singletary. Mike Singletary was definitely not a guy that could handle post tight moments <laughs> very well. He was, you know, Screamer. we could see his post game press post game press conferences and stuff, and uh, you know, then and then maybe when I was with the Rams and. Um, Gosh, now he's a defensive coordinator with the Chiefs. He, was, he came from the, being the defensive coordinator with the Giants. I can't uh, speak that well. Yeah. Yeah, he's pretty calm in, in what he did. But, you know, when he was at the Rams, I mean, he, he was only winning two or three or four football games. So, you know, honestly, you know, our tight games when, with Coach Callahan, you know, he was he was pretty good. You know, he never – obviously there were some frustrations, I mean, in, in during those time frames and, and close games and close losses, but you never really know it. And, he, and, and we knew, never knew it. Now, if you want to talk to maybe Zach or Matt Slauson or some guys in the offense, mm-hmm. you know, they might have some different stories, but he never messed with the defense. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we were we were close, you know, so I just – he kept it pretty close, you know, to the cuff and, and was, was, was calm, um, even with some of our tough losses. You know, I think back to, you know, Texas Tech, my junior year, you know, pretty much had that thing in the bag and, you know, and then, you know, usually you, we'd come in on Sundays to, to work out and and, uh, and to watch film. He actually gave us that Sunday off just because I think that, that took a lot on my staff and then, you know, obviously from the, what happened here before and, mm-hmm. and then, you know, took a lot on us and he's, you know, he gave us a day off, which that wasn't, that wasn't, that never came, you know, that was very rare. Uh, you know, Coach Dodge was pretty calm too, you know, he just kept fighting, right? And things were kind of getting out of control a little bit. Um, he always come to the, come to the side and say, you're on the side, like, hey, don't look at the scoreboard, just play. Mm-hmm. You know, leave the scoreboard up to us, just do your jobs, you know, things will work out. You know, if you're kind of getting your you're down a little bit early, just keep playing, things will always work out with momentum, don't pay attention to the scoreboard. So, you know, they did a good job, you know. They, they you know, they chew you out when it needed to be, but, mm-hmm. you know, when things were getting a little out of control, they, they, they kept pretty calm and they kept you, you know, Get your head in the right frame of mind. So, you know, mainly it was, I don't say that Callahan staff, even though I know some people would be shocked to, to hear that, you know, because mm-hmm. I know they have that negative connotation when you mentioned Callahan and, and Ty's grow around here, but uh, they were pretty good when, when things would go south. With Bo, you had time with him. Was he just a great motivator for you? Yeah, he was great. You know, he was hard. He was very, very hard on you. I mean, he, like, you know, Coach McBride always says, you know, you had a, he, he would, he would cheer your ass out, but you know he would. But then you know he would he would hug you too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, and you have to have that. That's just, that's just the game of football. You got to know when to, you know, get after someone. You got to know when to love someone. Um, that's that's a great you know thing with a coach. And he would get after you, but he was so fun to play for because when he played well, that's just really interesting. when he played well. There's there's nothing better than you know getting you know congratulations from a coach and you know just that love and that and you know that affection. And uh, Bo just had it, man. He was a good motivator. You you just wanted to play well for him. You always want to play well for your coaches, but Bo had that ability, I think, just to really connect with his players. Um, He knew the game so well, Um, and he was he was he was willing to do some different things. And and you know he he was he would tell it to you straight. You know he he would he would give it to you. And uh, you know as a player, you can appreciate that. He kind of you know he was. It was, you know, if anything was wrong, you'd always blame yourself first, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that's what you kind of got to appreciate as a, as a player. Jay Moore is with us. Jay, have a good weekend, buddy. This was fun to, to talk a while. Thanks for an extended sit down and, and making time today, bud. Any day, buddy. Gotta love black shirt Husker NFL or Jay Moore. Thoughts on Bo, thoughts on Bill, thoughts on kind of a theme the last couple of days with uh, handling that moment under pressure that, that, it's hitting the fan. How does your coach or your leader react? And that was a topic that, that Will addressed, Will Compton addressed with Bo Pelletti. Some good stuff from Jay on where they can go defensive line-wise as well with the, the big red and no to cowboy boots for Jay Moore. Will Wilson's in. Chris Schmidt, hope you're doing all right on a Friday. Winding down a Friday weekend edition tomorrow with Hale Varsity Radio, 7 to 9 a.m. So let's dive into some NFL real quick. And uh, three ball games tonight. Will, you've got uh, Vegas. They need better play, greater play at quarterback. The, the Chargers have Herbert. What's Act 2 look like for mm-hmm. him? The Rams got Stafford. And that could be real exciting. Dak and Dallas, 
How's he do coming back from injury? And then there's the Tua question mark. If you were to rank bigger question to confident, how would you rank those squads? I think Dak's good. Yeah. Okay. And he's got help. So I don't have I think from a from a safe place, I think I go I go Dak and I'm gonna go with Herbert. Yeah. I think I think those are the two guys that I'm confident that they can can be really good. Stafford, I think he'll be really good. Yeah. No acres is big. It's big. It's big. Well, so well, I'm I'm a wait and see on that. I cause, love cause Stafford. The, the Rams are in the toughest division. You've got mm-hmm. Arizona, you've got Seattle, you have San Francisco. Toughest yeah. division in football. Tua, they're expecting him to be Superman already. Mm-hmm. And I love the fish. Uh, the Marino years when they had snowflake kicking field goals. I don't know. I don't. I don't think they should. De- like if they could have gotten somebody name worthy, sure you deal Tua. Mm-hmm. But I don't think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I think it's too soon to, to punt on Tua. Agreed. Uh, with with Oakland, eh, fine, that's swear jar. I'm sorry. I, I screw it up. <laughs> I know it's Vegas. I know it's Vegas, baby. But I always screw that up. Yeah. The David Carr David Carr just is is okay. He's good dude. He's serviceable, but they got dudes around him. Yeah. They got enough dudes around him to be uh, at least finishing second to Kansas City. Yes. They do. Mm-hmm. Now, their defense is is a bit of a mess, but it's like their season went You see this in college, you don't expect it in pro football. But the minute that, that, that Mahomes rallied and they won that, that shootout in Vegas last year, 35-31, great game. Yep. But the minute that happened, it's like the, the, the season went from playoff to, all right, we're drafting somewhere in the teens. Right. And didn't they go to uh, their backup last year? Late well, they had the Mariota. Mariota, they went and, to and him. They, and I thought Mariota looked pretty good. Problem is Mariota gets breathed on wrong and he's hurt. And that's been his career. Because it, it's not for lack of talent. I mean, Mariota's talent to kid. We'll wind down a Friday. Thanks for spending time at Tail Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. And we're back. Fellas, you think we could listen to the radio? On Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! So we'll wind down a Friday. Garth Brooks tomorrow. I know most of the state is going or going to try and go or could go or can get in for cheaper, whatever you want to go about it with. But to enjoy Lincoln, be safe, be healthy, and and be uh, loud with all your friends and uh, loved ones at uh, Memorial Stadium tomorrow night. That's going to be awesome to have folks and uh, friends in high and low places for for Garth tomorrow. A lot of good Nebraska football talk with uh, Bill Dolman, Derek Peterson, and uh, Jay Moore right there. Let's uh, wrap up with Field of Dreams real quick just because it was so incredible last night. Numbers are in. Six million viewers. Think about that. Your typical, normal three-point nine and change or four millions what you'll get for a national audience on Fox for baseball typically but to go two million over for a Yankees <laughs> for a Yanks game <laughs> and then to have that open and and folks were going nuts on Twitter and it was really cool the way that game started the way it opened with Costner and then the players coming out of the cornfield it's as good of, of a opening to a sporting event as I've seen since uh, the, the firemen and the policemen came out of Memorial Stadium on 9-11 against mm-hmm. Rice. Sure. But this is this is touching, man. You just you think back mm-hmm. to all the times you played catch with your dad or you played catch with your kid, and it was great. Yeah. It was pretty pretty emotional, and so many dudes that get seasonal allergies with... with uh, yeah. With uh, this movie anyway. It's uh, it was beautiful. I agree, man. And and, and another topic, uh, brutal way to lose a game for the Yankees, man. Oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it it was great hearing the joy from Junior's room in the basement, you know, because Judge cranked one and and Stanton jacked one, 
And then I, I did not ground him for what I heard him scream from the basement after the two-run shot to lose it. Mm. <laughs> Brutal. I know the dogs started barking. They were not happy with his range of emotion, nor composure. <laughs> but that was that was pretty cool. So, but I tell you, with, with this Field of Dreams, the question also on Facebook was, should they do this every year or should it be one and done? And the Cubs are already locked in, I think, for next year. Mm-hmm. Ross said that in an interview today. But you got to do this every year and yeah. keep it at 8,000. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the MLB sees those ratings. You've got to keep that going. Oh, for sure. But keep it at 8,000 right. and open it up to the rest of the country. Because I think it was a lottery for only Iowans to go. Interesting. Huh. And a year later. But the White Sox are a good squad. And the Yanks are, are the star power. And you pair both of them together. It was cool, man. Yeah. it was. That was cool. I, I put it above uh, that college game that was on the aircraft carrier a few years ago. Oh, that the, was the cool. basketball game? That yeah. was sweet. All right, Willie J, uh, pour some cold ones for the folks tonight. God love you. Hardest working man there is. <laughs> we'll see you bright and early tomorrow morning. <laughs> Let's do it. I I will bring the coffee. Sweet. And uh, we'll send some coffee to Elijah. Good idea. Bless him. And uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Weekend edition. Myself, Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, Willie J sitting in. Get the podcast. Give us a rating. Good, bad, or ugly. We'll take it. Hail Varsity Radio, Spotify, Google Play, iTunes. Uh, We'll wake up with you tomorrow morning. Thanks.